Good morning. Uh, welcome to the International Business Ethics Case Competition and to uh, the session entitled Vines to Vessels. Uh, we have a master university, no, uh, yeah, master university. Sorry. My name is Ken Goodpaster. I'm the Uber judge for this session, and we have three other judges for this session. Uh, my background is a teacher of business ethics. I um, I started out at the University of Notre Dame and then went to the Harvard Business School and then finished my career at the uh, University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. Uh, and now they call me an emeritus professor. I, I think emeritus is Latin for over the hill. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm glad to be here with you. And I'd like to uh, ask my judges to uh, introduce themselves. Uh, uh, Leon, Goldman is one of them. Would you introduce yourself, Mr. Goldman? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Leon Goldman. I am a retired chief compliance and privacy officer at an academic medical center in Boston. Um, and prior to that was a general surgeon for 28 years at that academic medical center. And I'm also a emeritus over the hill uh, um, advisory board member for the Bentley Harvard Hoffman Center for Business Ethics. And that's me. It's an honor to have you as a judge. Thank, thank you for being with us. And our other judge um, so is going to have to type in a brief introduction, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and that would be uh, Raquel Forrest. Forrest. Yep. Can you hear me okay? Oh, we have your voice. Yes. Hi, how are you? Great. I thought you, I thought there was going to be some typing involved. No, no. I'm I'm good. I can I can talk. Um my name is Raquel Forrest. I uh, work for a um, mid-sized pharmaceutical or specialty pharmaceutical company. I'm their lead integrity and compliance investigator there. Um, I've also had several other roles um, within pharmaceuticals um, in the compliance arena, but um, I'm excited to be here and excited to hear uh, your presentation. Thank you for having me. We're delighted to have you uh, and thank you for your time. Uh, and our in-person judge is Jamie McKill. Hi everyone, my name is Jamie McKill. I'm a senior director with the firm uh, in compliance. So we essentially help organizations assess, implement, and improve their ethics and compliance programs. I've uh, been in this space for nearly 20 years. Um, prior to the thing, I was in-house at a large medical device company in the compliance and ethics program. And prior to that, I was with the Waterhouse Companies. Thank you for your time, your expertise. So you've heard this set up before, but I'll, I'll do it for the record here. In this part of the competition, you are taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin. You will have 25 minutes with a five minute cushion to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts. During this time, teams will be uninterrupted. And I'll do the timer. When you are finished, the judges will ask you questions for 20 minutes. During the Q&A, both you and the judges will stay in character with the fictional identities. Um, after the Q&A, the judges will give you feedback outside of the role play. And, um, some important things to keep in mind. The ethical aspects of your analysis are the most important part. However, these should be described in, sim in a simple, practical, common sense fashion, using technical philosophical terminology or basing your argument on religious or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. Similarly, any member of the team reading his or her part will also be considered a major mistake, although you may use notes. During this presentation, every member of the team must have some sort of speaking role. So you've heard that before, and 
now I turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you again. Once again, pleasure to meet you. Hi, I'm Nate. Hi, Cindy. Yeah. I'll leave you here with our executive summary, which you have as a copy. Yeah. Good morning. It might be a bit too early in the morning to talk about wines, but I'd like to share with you my personal experience. So I drink a lot of red wines and I like um, having different tasting notes, exploring different wines all over the world. But while I enjoy sipping my wines, I can't help but think, what are these made of? Are these ethically sourced? Like what's the situation behind the scenes? And so that what kept us thinking of the certain industry, the wine industry in Washington. Again, good morning. We'd we'll like to present to you Vines to Vessels, a circular future for wine companies in the West, presented by the Amicus Group of Consulting at McMaster University. So these are our group members. We have Ashna, Xavier, and I here in front of you, and we have Kashika and Prabhat as well online joining us. And Yes, thank you for waving for our um, digital uh, participants. So I'd like to ask you, do you know that pesticide and herbicide use in conventional vineyards contribute 70% more to greenhouse gases compared to organic vineyards? Again, this might be a global statistics, but I'd like to bring you back here in the United States. In 2022 alone, the wine bottles collected in the United States has brought up to about 2.57 billion wine bottles that could fill up one of the largest, if not the largest lakes in North America, which is Lake Superior, a landfill with a size of Lake Superior in just one year. Imagine that. And if in Washington we don't do our part, by 2040, Washington will be out of landfill space. So, and also with this situation, with the heavier bottles and with the more people being burned, this climate change would just get worse. So you as a Washington State Wine Commission would have the necessary steps to take in order to combat this. In fact, in the wine industry, in 2022, you had a whopping 10 billion profit but with this climate change, this could potentially threaten the whole industry with 150 million with the increasing uh, temperature by up to 2%, 2 degrees uh, Celsius or 32 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And just to give you a quick timeline of the wine industry in Washington, the seeds have been planted as early as in 1825 and flourished until their formative years in 1935 and the big bang in the early millennia in 2000. But after that, they have recorded massive wildfire amounting to 32,000 wildfires across the state, covering 6.6 .6 million acres, which is massive affecting different wineries up to a thousand of uh, wineries up to date and 400 wine grape growers. And with these grape growers, we have identified a friend of ours, Winston, who is a small winery business owner. And he has been in the business for three years now. And since he wants to be more closely related to the wine industry, he still has these pending pain points, major pain points. One of them is being worried about the growing pest problems, which resulted in him to resort to uh, buying the pests, like any pesticides, unethical or not, who knows? He doesn't know because he also doesn't have the resources to back this up. He also is threatened by the wildfire smoke that could potentially harm his business and also his consumers. And he tries to still be a responsible business owner, but again, he doesn't have a community. He doesn't know the resources available for, for him to, to use. And from his situation, we have taken into consideration these key issues. First one is on the toxins of raw materials and grapes, focusing on the effects of wildfire smokes and the increase of pesticide usage. And the second key issue is waste management practices, regarding the repurposing, recycling, and the reducing carbon footprint. From these key issues, we have 
pinpointed this opportunity that you, as a Washington State Wine Commission, can revamp traditional viticultural and improving waste management practices, which you can bridge the gap between ethical and sustainable issues while driving economic growth and becoming an industry leader. And from this opportunity, we have identified this recommendation, define wine plan, which my colleagues will be talking more about towards the later part of this presentation. And now I'd like to give you give the floor to Kashika for our ethical frameworks. Thank you, Neet. So considering all the issues that have been highlighted and everything that's going on in Washington right now, considering the wildfires and rising temperatures, we want to see where Washington stands right now in the ethical spectrum model. So there are a lot of rules and regulations and laws that are out there, but we think, consider Washington to be in more of a responsive state because there is an increasing moral consciousness amongst the personnel involved or people living in the state to do right by the society and by the uh, environment. Moving on to the decision making criteria that we considered for this, we tried to analyze the moral aspect, excuse me, the moral aspect and the professional aspect. For the moral aspect, we considered two things well being of place and well being of people. For well being of place, we considered the we considered that human rights should be upholded and these should be met. So in Washington, for instance, there are a lot of scenarios where the immigrant workers are still being paid minimum wages or even less at times. Often due to the increasing heat, they are forced to go nocturnal because it's not optimum for them to harvest the grapes during the daytime when the temperatures are high. Also, there's because of the rising heat, they are moving to more unsustainable practices, such as using of pesticides and other chemicals, which again is not very healthy if humans end up ingesting it. Moving on to the well-being of place, we try to analyze how can we impact the environment in the least harmful way possible. So we all understand that climate change and all of these unsustainable practices go hand in hand in a cyclical fashion. So we start using more unethical practices and that in turn causes wildfires, droughts, impressed outbreaks, and the cycle never ends. Because of this, and also because of the change in supply and demand, one of the bigger wine players in Washington state, St. Michel, had to cut down its grape contracts by 40% over the next three years. And that means more than 60,000 acres of land had to be wiped, up, wiped out. Moving on to the professional framework, we have said this in three different buckets, setting standards, taking action, and the ethical justice that are being, global justice that's being made. For setting standards, there are a lot of certifications that are there on point right now, but for obvious reasons, these are not mandatory. mandatory. The first one is life certification, which is there all throughout the Western coast of the US. But unfortunately, only seven wineries in Washington are certified by life. And to add on, they allow a carcinogenic pesticide to be openly used. The next, but one of the better, uh, better certifications is sustainable WA. It's a rigorous certification where only if the wineries have more than 75% of sustainable practices, they will be able to get it. But as of right now, only 30% of wineries in Washington have this as well. Very recently, almost a week, 10 days in the past, there was a partnership that was announced between Sustainable WA and Salmon Safe, essentially for water quality protection, wildlife habitat conservation, and climate resiliency, especially for the counties that are on the coastal areas. Moving on to taking actions, there are a lot of things that Washington right now is doing well. For instance, if they want to start a label with the AVA designation, that is American Viticultural Area designation, more than 75% of the grapes have to be harvested in the same area. But unfortunately, there are a few loopholes as well. For instance, the pesticide regulation loophole, for this, it completely depends on the individual's interpretation of what the law states and how much goal assessment is gonna be made. And that is open to interpretation again. The second one is Smoke Exposure Research Act. And in this, there's a lack of formal authorization for federal research. And this leaves a gap in addressing the issues comprehensively between the wine growers and the vineyards, in the vineyards. 
And the second one is there is no essential current crop insurance, which again leaves the leaves the vineyard owners vulnerable. Finally, moving on to the global ethics part, there are a lot of things that California or other states in the US or globally countries are doing that are very well, which have set the standards already super high. For instance, in California, it is encouraged for the vineyard workers to be it's encouraged for them to get a health insurance 401k and pay time off. And this vineyard owners are very happy doing. They understand the amount of work that the workers put in and it is appreciated. Unlike in the past, when almost 10 years ago, vineyard workers were paid by the tonnage of the grapes that were harvested. In UK and in Argentina, when they started moving from when they started moving towards lightweight glass bottles, more than 75, 25% emissions of carbon emissions were saved. With this, we want to see what is the current state. So moving, what is the current state? So we believe that there is a lot of scope for Australian, oh sorry, so for Washington Winery Commission to necessitate or facilitate a better or sustainable environment. They are. They have set very good. You have set very good standards, but still there's a lot of scope. With this, I would now like to pass on to Ashna for our legal. Thank you, Kashika. Uh, talking about the legal side of things, uh, we study a few legislations that Washington currently has in terms of pesticides, and we did find certain gaps. So highlighting the first one, there is a lack of specific guidelines. Uh, the regulations for, for which pesticides are allowed and which are not is unclear. And uh, the existing laws are very minimal. So there is no law right now that says uh, that which crops, on which crops you can use certain pesticides, which, uh, and these laws do not address grave pest management at the moment. There is also a gap that we found in terms of penalties and violation. So there is a penalty of uh, no more than $1,000, which is way below uh, the federal penalty, which is way uh, $20,000. We see this gap in terms of penalties. Uh, and that uh, that that might just really do not in, like encourage that bad behavior. Uh, and moving on to our, the next law that we studied, we studied the bottle waste collection uh, and how it is globally. Uh, a lot of countries uh, do great at it. Uh, Canada, so Ontario, British Columbia, and Alberta have a container uh, deposit program, and this has led to high recycling rates there. Uh, Europe also does a deposit fund, uh, deposit refund systems, and these have been embraced by a lot of countries in Europe, such as Germany, Sweden, Norway, and it's working really well for them. It's been really successful. Uh, moving to Australia, Australia also does a container deposit schemes, uh, and these uh, have had the high success rates. Uh, and talking about US, so the United States, uh, the bottle bill has been implemented in 10 states in United uh, state, States currently. And if you do a deep dive into this, we see that uh, California, Connecticut, Hawaii are these are one of the, these are some of the states that have a, a bottle bill in the US. What it has done, the advantages are that it has raised awareness. Uh, consumers have got it. Uh, more, um, they they become more mindful of conservation and waste management issues. Michigan and Oregon have the highest return rates of U.S. Uh, of U.S. built states, and this is uh, directly proportional to the high deposit rates that customers are paying, and that compels them and incentivizes them to return those bottles in turn to get their money back. And uh, moving on to the Washington State wine industry, this is more of a business side of things that we've seen. Uh, and a few stats here uh, that it is an over a nine uh, billion dollar economic activity in the state of Washington. Washington is the second largest producer of wine, and it has produced seventy million uh, cases in twenty twenty two. But uh, if you if you want to see ninety percent of these wineries make less than five thousand cases per year. So this is just to highlight that Washington has a lot of independent small wineries, uh, and that's why. Most of them don't make over 5,000 cases a year. Uh, talking about the Washington State Wine Commission, so we we did uh, we sort of did some research on how uh, your how how you as a commission are operating and the purpose. The purpose is clear: it is to represent uh, all licensed wineries across Washington. 
and by raising awareness on Washington wine practices. And there are a lot of initiatives we saw that you are conducting through marketing and communicating activities. However, we see that there is a certain there is a certain gap. Like despite all these sustainability initiatives, the pesticide regulations currently are vague, and even the bottle uh, recycling process, the wineries are not uh, responsible for it, and that's why they're causing some gap in terms of the bottle management process. And that's why our friend Wilson, who's a small winery owner, he he doesn't feel like he gets full support from the commission. But uh, talking about, and why does he feel like this? Because there has been a market loss. So over $150 million uh, have resulted as a market loss from wildfires. There is a uh, 15%, like less than 15% of the wines uh, undergo a recycling process. And as, uh, as Kashika mentioned earlier, only 30% of the total wines are registered under the sustainable W certification. Also looking at, uh, this is just, we've uh, had, we've, we, this is a diagram of what shows of the emissions and the breakdown. So we see that uh, just an alarming uh, stat here is that 44% uh, of the emissions come from wine yards. So they, they are a great cause for carbon footprints uh, in the whole cycle of wine making. And lastly, I'd like to talk about wine bottles. So just wine bottles, most of the glass bottles are made from virgin materials. Consumers are very accustomed to these wine bottles. They have not considered a shift from wine to any other source uh, yet. And glass is heavy to transport. And the heavier it is, the more carbon footprints it's gonna generate. So that again is a pressing issue. And disposing these, as Nate mentioned, that by 2040, uh, we suspect that Washington is not gonna have any more of these place, which, which is again a pressing concern. I'd now like to call in uh, Prabhat to discuss the recommendation plan. Bye. Thank you, team. With all the issues and gaps identified in the ethical, legal, and business aspects of this entire case, we recommend with the Fine Wine Plan, where fine stand for foster resilience, integrate pest management, necessitate best practices, and finally, but not the least, engage the communities within the wine industry. Let's deep dive into some of the specific analysis that we have done for this implementation plan. The first is foster resilience. Over here, we recommend the commission to introduce mock taint management and removal methodology as Washington State Wine Commission best practices resource. This additional resource will be coming off, coming off from the international standards and specifically we recommend you to the implement the ninth solution for filtering based on the Australian Wine Research Institute standards. With this, our friend Winster is now very happy as he can be transparent with his consumers. Now, talking about what will be the ethical impact of this entire phase. There will be reduction of waste from the tainted wine. And through this, the commission would be able to facil facilitate sharing of knowledge and providing all the wineries and chance for a better production. We have also estimated what will be the KPIs and cost for that. 200 to 300 new wineries will make sure this is a successful phase and an estimated cost of $182,000. Now deep diving in some of the specific practices, here is a list of all the smoke taint management principle which the commission should implement in the different wineries within Washington. And the nine AWRI standards which we were discussing before, here is a list of them. Specifically treating smoke affected wine with activated carbon and treating smoke affected wine with nanofiltration are some of the most uh, important and famous objectives which has been placed throughout the history within Australia. And now moving towards the next leg of our implementation plan is the integrated pest management. Over here, we recommend the commission to highly advocate to shift towards the alternative of synthetic pesticides, which is the organic way of doing this pesticide practices. We also recommend to propagate the knowledge of IPM to small to medium wineries specifically because as of now, they currently lack the support. We would also recommend to increase the presence of natural predators, predators of pests and lessen the pesticide usage to drive ethical, ethicality and sustainability. Aim to shift towards the regenerative agriculture is one other recommendation that we would like commission to give to the small and medium wineries. What's the ethical impact now? 
there is a low risk of having pesticides on wine, there will be a decrease in exposures of labors to the poisonous pesticides. We have also estimated the KPIs and cost of this plan over here. An estimated cost of $160,000 should ensure the successfulness of this entire phase. Now, talking about some of the major guidelines of the integrated pest management plan, here is a list. Over here, we recommend to prepare, prevent, monitor, analyze, manage, apply, and last but not the least, reevaluate, making sure the wineries are reevaluating re the, uh, the specific steps to fine tune the response and make proactive plans for the next time. And now over to Xavier to discuss about the next set of implementation plan. Thank you, Prabhat. So after we foster, after we integrate, we want to nurture. So specifically, we want to necessitate best practices. Um, this includes mandating the switch to lighter weight bottles, also reinforcing the bottle bill and really incite that greater return rate. And then lastly, we want to expand our partnership with Recork. We've noticed that Recork have, has done great work with giving uh, the cork of the wine bottle new life and also reducing the, their emissions. So we believe we can expand that outreach. This also includes altering the sustainable WA certification. Many of the wineries in Washington do not have this certification, so we need to update it. So not only do they strive for this certification, they have greater access in, and there will be no, nothing, no barriers to, to acquire this. This includes a pressing strategy. We want to base it off of revenue so that the smaller wineries still have the opportunity to receive this certification. And the ethical impacts include a lighter bottle will reduce emissions. The, the bottle bill really incentivizes the, the better practice to re recycle our, our wine bottles rather than ending up in landfill. And also it creates more jobs as we expand uh, the recycling practice. And lastly, Recork has a, a few locations currently, but once we increase those, we can further negate the, the, the carbon effect. And also it, it replaces, it's able to replace harmful petroleum-based fuels and plastics. We've set up a few realistic KPIs to measure the success of this plan. And also we estimated a budget of 68,000. And lastly, for our fine wine plan, we want to engage communities. Community is going to be at the heart of this plan because we can't do it alone. Not one winery is responsible for the, the damage or facing this moral conflict alone. So we want to enhance the inter-ABA uh, communities um, and incentivize collaboration. We want to have them the ability to share information, also integrate in their own in their own systems and promote the best practices. This includes enhancing a digital uh, appearance. We want that information to be accessible, and also we want to really engage wineries and wine enthusiasts alike. You know, this is um, this is really important. So we want the wine commission to have it front. Uh, center to really show the, the Washington community that this is an important uh, uh, an initiative. So we recommend having a specific community engagement tab right on the home page. Um, this would, as I said before, it would incite growth, able to share knowledge, and also inspire one is to set goals and reach those ESG numbers. Here are the KPIs that we want to measure the success of the plan. And also we have an estimated budget of two hundred. Here is a mock-up of what it would look like. As I said before, front and center, we want to increase that engagement and, and couple it with additional events to really energize. We want to push, push this project. And as I said before, the, the stronger the community, the better the plan. Moving forward, as I remind you to the report card we gave the commission before, with our recommendation, our, our we believe that we can turn all these two green you know, for a well-being of people, well-being of place, and becoming an ethical champion. 
of setting standards of taking action and also for global justice. Now I'll pass it off to me to go over some risk mitigations. And of course, in any implementation plan, there would be a couple of risks. And we have identified these top three risks in front of you, but I'd like you to focus your attention on the topmost part, which is the resistance in adoption of bill. We acknowledge that there might be a couple of stakeholders that would be um, uh, in the process, that would be involved in the process of submitting this bill. And so how we encourage or how we would try to mitigate this risk is to enforce it regionally. You're, you're fine, it's 25, you've got five minutes. Okay, thank you. Yes, and uh, um, also apart from that, we provide financial incentives of or cost sharing for early adopters. We'll also try to build coalitions with environmental groups, recyclers and other uh, key stakeholders to, uh, to advocate for this legislation. Fine wine. Who doesn't like fine wine, right? But this fine wine would need a fine wine plan. And now with this fine wine plan, our friend here, Winston, is now able to apply best practices to manage the pests and effects of wildfire smoke. He's also able to establish a better recycling process for him and his consumers. And at the same time, he's more confident now than ever that he is a responsible owner that can meet ESG goals and stay ahead of trends. And uh, he'll be more engaged more than ever. Foster resilience, integrate pest management, necessitate best practices, and engage communities. The fine wine plan. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, and we, as members of the Washington Statewide Commission, uh, have some comments or questions for you. Um, do you want to give us a start? Sure. Uh, one question I had was that you talked a little bit about how you want for the bottle requirements, you wanted to tie those to the revenue of wineries so that you know smaller wineries wouldn't have to bear the burden of the cost uh, or as much cost as the larger wineries. Do you have similar thoughts related to some of the other requirements in terms of the smoke? Tank management and also the, the integrated pest management. So, for the wineries to get their WA a certification, they have to go through the the certain charters and reach the the, the, the majority in order to be considered a sustainable. One. So in your question, we want to expand that because it's missing that piece with the bottles and also the, the wildfire smoke per uh, prevention. And then we also recognize that the large wineries will be easier than for them to incorporate these practices. So that's where the commission comes in, being the maestro between the wineries, the community, and the state, and be able to per provide support and, and the understanding so they can adopt these practices. Uh, our two online judges, uh, if I could turn to uh, Raquel. Thank you. I actually had a similar uh, question about costs, but I'll I'll move on. Are, are there, um, have you guys thought about how, I guess in my role, we think a lot about um, our training standards and things of that nature. Has there any bit, been any thought of, you know, not only how I, this plan, but also the training standards or training that might need to happen in order for this to um, come to fruition? I can take that one. Thank you so much for the question. Absolutely, uh, training was uh, definitely one of the things that we had. In mind and that's why if we go to our uh, if we go to our engagement piece of our um it's the, that one the next one. yeah so if we go to our community engagement piece uh the whole idea of this is to foster like though these wineries are competing for business with each other is to create that whole uh feeling of being in this together and that's why uh we have best best practice sharing week where they sort of share their best practices. Uh, like if they're undergoing some trainings for their laborers or if they have something to share that other owners can take into account and implement then. So that's something that we would definitely 
look into as a part of community engagement and a critical piece here also again uh, to your point is uh, training because we believe that from those best practices uh, they could create an impact and uh, grow together so that was definitely considered and that's something we definitely want to do as in our best practice sharing week as well so i answer your question yes mm -hmm. okay mr goldman Mr. Goldman? Me? Uh, Jesus. I think he can hear you now. Maybe he's muted or He's unmuted. I'll have the Zoom host. Okay. Well, while we're trying to get Mr. Goldman, I have a question. Um, as a commissioner, um, I always have this puzzle about <clears throat> encouraging Washington State's uh, success as a state among states and also encouraging competitiveness within the state. So I've got, I've got this puzzle. Uh, there's capitalism going on here among consenting adults. Um, and I want, I want to encourage competition. And yet some of your suggestions and recommendations sound to me like sharing of things that if you did it on a federal basis would be called antitrust violations uh, because you're you're sharing information across across competitive companies um, how do you want us as commissioners to keep those balls in the air i mean do you understand the puzzle you're presenting to us um, we're, we're, we're supposed to look after the well-being of the state of Washington, of course, but we, we can't do that blindly. Um, competition is good for the state of Washington, too. Help me out here. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. And that's actually one of the, the things that we also brainstormed before and well, how we are trying to, or how, how we could factor that in, that the competition piece is through our uh, community engagement still. So um, we understand that the best practices that we're talking about here uh, could be uh, online, like they could, they could be uh, accessible online. And these are not necessarily the, the like uh, industry secrets. Some might be, some might just be practices that might not be known for, especially for small wineries that has like lesser resources and lesser knowledge, especially if they're just starting with their business. And so uh, what we um, are trying to say here is with the best practices, it could be online, but with the competition piece, we have identified that there are 20 ADAs or the American Viticulture Areas. And how we are um, thinking about um, doing these competitions is to have that inter or intra ADAs uh, competition, um, maybe like a seasonal thing of like, having uh, the best uh, wine uh, of like a of like a variety or like uh, your best spin on a, on on a certain wine so you know like um we can have those competitions for sure and remain a, a friendly environment still um whilst um uh, sharing those best practices still for for the best interest of everybody it's a tough balance again it is it is a tough balance but um, I think with the engagement piece, once they get comfortable, they would be more at peace, and at the same time, they would be, they would be more encouraged to push their some, themselves to the to the limits. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions from the from the judges. I have one other question. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
So one of the big aspects of the proposal was recycling program around recycling bottles. There are obviously other stakeholders involved besides the wineries and that you know, retailers who have to figure out how they're gonna work their aspect of that, and also the whoever is ends up recycling um, the products. And we really thought how to incentivize those folks um, to participate in these programs. I, uh, I can I can take a shot at this question. So, looking at the entire wine industry at Washington, we realize that they are quite behind. You know, California is the top producer, and they have a lot of practices and regulations around the whole process, whether it is recycling or managing the raw materials. That's why our fine wine plan is very important because we don't want to cause any extra heartache or barriers. These uh, wineries, the other stakeholders already have a lot on their plate. So incorporating the consumer in, 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 into the process is very important. That is with knowledge and awareness. And also the uh, the logistics that they play is a key piece with it. it is transporting the bottle who is responsible. How do we trust that these, this bottle is not just going to be magical and, and brought back in? So as Washington, as a state, we, uh, we talk about community a lot, but yeah, just coming together as the stakeholders to, to address that. Are we, is the consumer getting the majority of cost? We'll look into that. Hopefully we can set up these, dis, these distribution areas or how they deal with the wine so that the consumer does not bear this extra cost. We will bring in those stakeholders in the conversation. You know, our fine wine plan is very fine because it gets better with time, like wine. So once we incorporate them, we can learn from those stakeholders and have a better process for the future. I see Mr. Goldman is, is back. I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So my question, this is a major undertaking. It's vast. Um, we're going to have to ultimately engage the entire citizenry of Washington State. And you're asking us to ask them to pay more money than they had before. Not something people like to do. We also have to engage the legislature and the wineries. Do you have any suggestions as to in what order we engage the champions from each of these sectors? to try and move this along because without champions, especially in the legislature and in the um, wine industry, we're probably doomed. This becomes just us sitting around having a nice website. Um, so what would you suggest? I can take that question for the team. So uh, can you please go towards the end of the slide? We have an appendix uh, for the consumer behavior towards this aspect. So as part of our research, we have identified that, first of all, the main thing is that the cost of, for example, let's say waste management, the cost of depositing those bottles would fall upon the shoulders of the end consumers. That's one thing. But we identified through a research and a survey that 94% of the Washington state uh, people are more than happy to accommodate that bottle bill. That's that, yeah, that's the first aspect. And talking about the second aspect that how the champions in the legal, uh, the legislative uh, team would accommodate this aspect is that everyone is ready for a bottle bill now. The bottle bill has been successful in the other 10 states and there have been a lot of campaigns in Washington in the last few years which were uh, supportive of the bottle bill campaign and specifically in light of the key issues that we have presented here today, bottle bill is more than necessary in the current landscape. So we strongly believe that the legislative through this uh, implementation through this fine wine plan we would be able to pursue the champions as well as the end consumers thank you seven minutes remaining in this portion of our uh, role play um, so if, if uh, 
any of the judges would like to ask a further question, please feel free. I have one additional question. Um, the cost that's going to be passed to the consumer, how does that that cost increase um, compare to the cost that's incurred from wineries from outside of the state? Yeah, I can take that question up. So over here, as most of the recommendation that we have presented over here, there is only one aspect of the entire fine wine plan where the cost of the uh, implementation would fall upon the shoulders of consumers. And that's only the waste management, which covers the aspect, aspect of recork partnership and the bottle deposit. The bottle deposit, how it works is if it gets implemented in the legislative assembly. So it's an additional 10 deposit, uh, 10 cents uh, on the deposit of each and every bottle, which they would get back once they deposit that bottle towards the to, uh, towards the their drop off location. And rest of the recommendation that we have presented here, all of the costs would fall upon the shoulders of either Wine State Commission or the wineries or the manufacturers of the wine bottles. I uh, haven't been a resident of Boston for, for 10 years. I, I grew a great deal of affection for the ocean. And when I moved to Minnesota, uh, my affection switched to Lake Superior. Uh, and when you said filling Lake Superior with wine bottles, it, 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 it broke my heart. Um, and uh, that analogy uh, made me think, is there a lower limit to the amount of glass that you can put in a wine bottle? Um, I can take a question. Yes, there is a, a lower limit, and that's why we want to implement that into our plan. We can actually create these wine bottles with, with less glass and keep the same quality, look, and style as your tra tra traditional wine bottle. So if you go to our implementation plan of uh, necessitate best practices, as you can see in the ethical impact, um, I'll read out to you. Um, the, the, the lighter boat bottles equals to less glass consumed. As I said before, uh, majority of the glasses are from raw materials. They don't re re recycle used glasses. So we, we reduce the amount of, of mining for that material. And also with the lighter weight, we can reduce the carbon emissions through trans. But at some point, you've got to stop, don't you? Yes, at some point you do have to stop. The great thing about glass is that it's a forever material. It means you can reuse it and the, the components won't the, the, the deteriorate. This is why it's an ethical issue because there's not enough of that practices where they take those old wine bottles and really cut back on mining for new ones. So as you said, we want to keep it out of the lake and keep it as cups. We want to find new life for this glass because it can last. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure we're completely communicating here. You're asking us to pass a bottle bill. Mm -hmm. And if you want us to ratchet that bottle bill down to the bare minimum, and yet you don't want the bottles breaking on the shelf mm -hmm. because they're too thin. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 was that wasn't much of a concern because the suppliers of the, the bottles can confirm that the durability of the bottle is the same. That, that was my concern. And you look at the bottle the wrong way and it breaks. Yeah, no, no, yes, yes. It's it's the, the way it's formed, it will be able to uh, have the classic bottle feel and Argentina is doing something like that just to add. They've reduced their weight from 525 grams to uh, less than four, like 400 grams now. And they've seen a 25% reduction in uh, the uh, in the waste, in the carbon emissions. And uh, like it's, it's all positive. So we find that there's a success story from there as well. That it does not affect the quality. Glass apparently is the best material to use for this industry. 
given the nature of the product? Give, given the nature of the product, given the the history of the product, we understand there's a deep rooted history of wine. That's why we're not here saying oh, all your wine cans, even though technically you can say when you cut back a lot, we still want to preserve the heart of the wine. Okay. Any other questions from our judges? This portion, we got one minute left. Okay, then. Why don't we shift gears and come out of our roles as uh, <laughs> commissioners and uh, just move to our roles as as judges and, and counselors um, in terms of your presentation. Um, let's start with you. Why did you do that? Sure. I thought y'all did a great job, um, but you've given sort of the, the unique presentation where you had people in person and online and that transition very well. Um, look, a couple of things. One is the slides were a little busy. Generally speaking, I know you're trying to cram a lot of information into a certain amount of time, uh, but there was a couple of times where I was trying to read the slides and listen to you guys talk at the same time. It was a little confusing because I was trying to capture all the information on the slides, but also pay attention to what you're talking about. So in the, in the future, I would focus less on the slides and more so we can focus our attention on the speaker. Presentation. Um, and then also understanding again, you're trying to cram a lot of information in 25 minutes. Uh, in the future, when you have presentations where you don't have a time limit, I encourage you guys to just slow down a little bit. Uh, but again, I know you're trying to get the whole thing into a time limit. So that is still time. But yeah, overall, I did a great job. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Goldman. Um, thank you. You can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, and again, I, I commend you on, on your work in the presentation. Um, this is an enormous topic again. Um, and to reiterate what was said about the slides, the slides should, uh, just have the highlights so people can concentrate on what you're saying. The other thing in the beginning, I got a little confused. Now that may be because I'm getting old and adult, um, but it helps if at the beginning of the presentation, you very concise, you know, you have, I think, a 90 second presentation or something like that coming up, that you actually start that way. This is what we're going to tell you. And then tell me, and then tell me again, this is what we told you, uh, just so it sticks in the head. And it needs to be, I think, a sort of concise of why does it matter to us? You know, if, the, if it's global climate change, yeah, that's nice. And you know, it's more about the wine industry and what's going to happen to it if we don't do this and why we need to engage everybody to make it happen for the sake of the state's economy and the individual wineries. But overall, this is quite a very nice presentation. And uh, I appreciate your work. And, and you really did a fine job following on each other and getting the information across. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Yes. Uh, first, you, I thought you guys did a great job. Um, your transitions were great. Um, I think someone else said that even though this is a unique environment where um, some folks are live and others are virtual, it, it seemed pretty seamless to me in that regard. Um, I think I would have liked to have seen, uh, and maybe this was one of the comments too, is like with the fine wine, I when we got to the um, the plan of, of fine, I didn't quite get it necessarily. And then at the end, I think it all came together with the fine wine and how everyone likes fine wine. So maybe that would have been something to kind of introduce a little bit earlier on as someone might've mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. And I would definitely say, you know, slow down, take your time. You guys had a lot of information on the slide. And I did um, find myself trying to read versus listen. And so maybe as someone else said, less information on the slide and just slowing down a little bit would have been helpful um, for me. But I thought you guys did a wonderful job. I think it's a hard topic and it's one I know nothing about. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, and for my part, I hate to 
hate to keep repeating what the others said, but it really is true. You put too much information on each slide and you move the slides too quickly and it, it frustrates the audience. Um, and you don't want to build up a resentment <laughs> as you go through your presentation. You want to win over your audience. You don't want to frustrate them. I think you had a, a, a lot of good information, but you, you could present that information in a much more concise way with just a few words on the slide, and you can make up for that with your with your uh, elocution from you. And um, the um, because I found myself trying to read the slide and then zoom it went away and I didn't get a chance. And, um, and then I was trying to pay attention to you and it really is, that's something that's fixable. Now, it's not fixable in this competition because they won't let you use slides tomorrow in the 10 minute. And of course, in the 90 second, we can't. But uh, for future, for future information. And I know you put a lot of work into this thing. It's very obvious that you did. So uh, I want you to get the best result for the work that you put in. Um, I thought the use of Winston was very clever and, and very useful. It brings your presentation down to earth. It makes it human. And uh, I could understand Winston. I could understand Winston's need to understand the input problem, toxins, and I could understand Winston's need to understand the output problem, waste and, and the bottle issues and all that. And so it, it was a very useful device for the presentation as a whole. And so I commend you on that. And uh, as you go forward tomorrow with your uh, presentation for the ethics portion, um, there may be a way for you to capitalize on Winston. Um, but you're, you, what you're gonna focus on, of course, is the, the ethical argument. Um, but um, he helps you humanize the whole picture. So as you noodle about it tonight and tomorrow, uh, that's only a suggestion. There may be other ways for you to 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 do it tomorrow. I'm not I'm not prescribing it or anything, but I, I really did like that part of your presentation. Um, do you have any questions for us? I mean, we're just we're here available to you when we've got a few minutes. As judges or as the mic. <laughs> What? As judges or as a wine commission? Well, <laughs> as, as, as judges, yeah. Um, I personally don't have, but I just wanted to thank all of the, uh, the, the feedback. They, they're very helpful, especially when we move to our next uh, next stage, uh, next slide. <laughs> um, but yeah, like uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll pretty much um, bring all of those comments for tomorrow's presentations. Yeah, yeah. well, good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. And also, thank you for the online. Thank you. 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 Thank you.